Okay, welcome to another episode of Contract Systems Institute. What did you say? Coffee in the Coffee with with start? Start. Okay, so we're going <laughs> to name it eventually. But this is a half, almost half, of the members of the Institute. And uh, we're going to do this to introduce our members, sometimes as a group, sometimes one at a time. They research who they are as people because they're going to change the world. Right. So we're going to just start by asking everyone, each one of you to introduce yourself name, where you're from, and anything you want to tell us about you, that kind of different. No pressure. Who wants to go first? Yeah, Mick. Hi. How are you <laughs> What's your name? Who are you? I'm, I'm Mick Smithwood, and um, I came to the Complex Systems Institute lab um, from a visualization background. You saw uh, the light computer finally. Interaction. Yeah. Yes, I saw the light finally. Yeah, sure. Um, my research has to do with visual complexity and um, visual search of icons. What is that mean, visual complexity? Visual complexity. So, um, you know, you could think of it as the number of components in an image. You can think of it as um, how complex the meaning behind it is. You can. Um, there are lots of different metrics that can be used to determine the visual complexity of an image. I'm just looking at icons, so it's a little bit more um, uh, figure out. Uh, so what is better, few me few features, but obvious meaning, or a lot of features and pretty, but yeah. you don't know what it is. So it, when it comes to icons, especially, it's not so important that it's ornate. Oh, really? um, it, yeah. it is good if it has a good design um, overall. So one object as opposed to lots of different objects. Okay. Yeah. And where are you from? Um, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Oh, I, um, I never knew that. Yes, cool. yes, yes. And you're not a Cowboys fan. Is that what um, you, well, you when I was there, football. they won. So, yeah. you know, I was then. But, yes. um, uh, yeah, so. Well, I guess that's okay, about cool. it. Farah, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Farah, and um, I'm originally from Lebanon. Um, and why are you looking at him? Uh, I'm just trying to look at Something special about me, I guess, uh, how I made it to be here. I uh, came to the U.S. when I was 19, and I went to do my bachelor's for like four years in Berkeley, and then I went to Boston, and then I decided to go back to Lebanon, and then I realized there's an opening in view, that's when I started here. So how did you find it? I had a friend uh, of a friend who told me. So your, the first right. friend was your student, but that I didn't know him. I knew the friend of that friend right. in Lebanon, and she told me that there is an opening there. So I got to be in touch with you and see how it happened. You did not know much about complex systems then. It was really I honestly was... didn't know much, but it was actually something that I was uh, thinking I've always been searching for. Because the, the friend said, like, this guy is easy, so it worked with him. Not really. He, he, he described you as um, a faculty member who's wanting to broaden the horizon of research in terms of bringing complexity and explaining a lot of dynamics, uh, dynamical um, research work. So um, I came from the healthcare background. So I started looking what is complexity. That's how it started. And I realized complexity is common sense. And it uh, spoke to me. And I felt like, you know what? It might be something I might be interested in. So I started looking at healthcare and complexity. And, and I made that my decision. Like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, taking a different perspective um, of healthcare from a different angle that I had. Yeah, we'll talk about it soon. Bree, how about you? Hi, I'm Bree. Uh, he's cool. He's looking at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> he's gonna wave and say hi, mom. Hi. <laughs> hi <laughs> okay. Um, I'm from China, and I came here five years ago, and I got a master here. After finishing that, I uh, work for a little while. Then I decide to go further in the school, and there's this chance that there's a friend of mine who is a student here and who took Dr. Musa's class. Is it what you are? Uh, no, no, uh, Jimmy. Okay. Yeah, and she told me that mm, you should apply for this professor. He, he 
gives the student a lot of freedom in what um, they do whatever they want. To do. Yeah, 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 that's a good compliment. That's <laughs> why I was told, and that's what I'm having now. And then I uh, come here. I talk with Dr. Masab. He said that yeah, if, if that's what he wants. And I, I didn't know about complex system before that, but that's the first time in our first talk uh, you show me all your students working at Logo. That's when, when I get to know about this and I find it very interesting and I decided to work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, from Rob Abbott, I moved up here in 2008. South Alabama and the Gulf Coast. It wasn't yeah. enough to say Alabama. Yeah. South, 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 right? Well, it's, it's, you, you've got to refer yeah. to it because everybody hears Alabama and they think, oh, Huntsville, which is the complete other end of the state because that's where the Rockets are. But uh, moved up here in 2008 just in time for the uh, financial market collapse, which was an excellent thing to participate in since I was working <laughs> for one of the banks at the time. And uh, my background is in uh, uh, engineering, process uh, systems, process control, big data analytics. I've been doing large-scale uh, data analysis and machine learning for about 24 years. And I got involved with the complex systems program here uh, because of some experiences at work dealing with very large-scale systems and cascade failures and system dynamics. And I was witnessing very large-scale infrastructure problems and wanted to study more about complexity. And uh, as I started searching, I came to understand that Charlotte had a, UMC Charlotte had a complex systems institute. So I took a class out of the blue with Dr. Mursad and uh, kind of uh, got pulled into the, into the experience over time. It took about a little over a year you get a little bit close and eventually gravitation pulls you in. But the work that we do here is, is really interesting to me in terms of understanding the hidden dynamics of how everything basically becomes uh, or can be recognized as a complex system uh, if you look at it on the right scale or from the right perspective. Thank you. Is Amber Jackson's wife uh, from Turkey. And uh, my background was in industrial engineering, and I came here four years ago for systems engineering PhD program. And I was working on system dynamics <coughs> modeling, agent based modeling in my master's degree on socioeconomic systems and inequalities. Uh, I wanted to work on this for my PhD too in systems engineering, but somehow it turned to green logistics or supply chain. Of course, I was interested in these type of subjects too, but I still wanted to do complex systems modeling again and again. Then I saw in that spring, Dr. Mursad opened a course, Complex Adaptive Systems. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. I just emailed him, can I have this access to this course and he just done. And I uh, modeled Gazify protest in that class. And it turned out like I wanted to work even more on this modeling. And I asked him, is there any opportunities like, you know, I can work with another professor, do you know someone else? I know you are so busy, but I want to maybe work, collaborate with other professors as co-advisor or something. And he asked me, why not? You are thinking me, and I'm like, you are so busy. And he said, no, if you want, like, maybe you can start PhD here. And I switched my uh, PhD program to software and information systems from engineering. And is one of my uh, biggest uh, ideas. She still regrets it. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I can't tell. Like, it was the best choice ever that I had. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm Anna Tahmed. I am originally from Bosnia and I uh, moved to the United States in uh, 1998 in uh, South Dakota. And I moved to Charlotte in uh, 2010 um, to do my master's in economics at UNCC. And um, 
I wanted yeah. to be rich from day one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's happening. It, so far, so good, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, after I finished my master's, I went and uh, worked. I'm still working uh, uh, for one of the banks here in Charlotte, and I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, however, I'm, uh, something, I guess, unique about me is that I, I, I love to learn. I love to be challenged. I live with the idea of um, education is a catalyst for change. So it really strikes to me, and um, I've uh, known Mirsad from the community, and I... And basketball. And basketball, of course. Can't forget that. You play basketball? I guess we call it playing. <laughs> Um, and uh, we struck a conversation, and I asked him about uh, you know the possibility of uh, joining his lab, and uh, um, he talked more about complex complexity uh, and kind of what it means, and it really struck with me because um, I I like the interdisciplinary approach. If you look at all the different problems that we're facing um, in the world, it's not a siloed approach. You can't just take one tool to fix it all. And um, my research uh, that I'm in the beginning of doing uh, uh, deals with international trade, where I can use my economics background and apply, uh, eventually apply a uh, agent-based model towards uh, measuring trade, um, uh, international trade specifically. Okay, so this is good. The two of you actually mentioned what it is that you're working on. I understand it a little deeper, but let's talk now about uh, the focus of your PhD or what you would like it to be. Anything else you want to um, what you just said. As I mentioned, um, it's, I'm still kind of in the early stage of my uh, research. Um, I really hope to uh, be able to uh, build a model, uh, agent-based model, that's able to find hidden things, as Rob mentioned, um, hidden dynamics that's happening that we can't see with traditional models, uh, traditional economic models. And uh, hopefully with that we can, you know, um, use that to leverage possibly to change policy, um, with, with what's happening, uh, trade policy. Um, so that's kind of my goal along the line. Do you to do that? I'm, I was working in upward economic mobility issues in my master's degree. Now I'm still interested in uh, inequalities in the society. In that sense... There is inequality issue in society? In the, in the society. There is? There is inequality. inequalities in the society. Yeah, yeah. Surprise. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so still uh, working on it, but uh, my also other interest is social movements, modeling the uh, like social media effects on social movements, how it helps or it doesn't help the moves and interactions of uh, agents. Still, uh, maybe I should mention here too data science for social good project yes, that we are working on. So it might uh, change a little bit my research focus too because I started uh, working on uh, big data, let's say big data, for social good to help our community and to understand their problems, like NGOs, government problems, to solve some, to help solving, maybe we can't solve these big problems, but to help solving, to give some approach to these problems. So, yeah. Did you participate in those protests in Turkey? <laughs> Should I say that? So don't say anything. No Someone might be watching. <laughs> I'm sure I see a rebel or what. She can model herself. Yeah, Rob, what do you it's... think? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my, uh, I came to the university, as I said originally, to study uh, complex systems dynamics. But I've always had a, a strong passion for artificial intelligence and machine learning since I was a and um, my desire or my motivation is to design a system that is capable of being dropped into a completely foreign environment and learn the dynamics of the system from basically a ground zero uh, tabula rasa perspective. And that's a, a very, the acquisition and modeling of a knowledge base is a very complex dynamic system by definition. So. My research is around how to have a system understand when it needs to learn and to heuristically figure out what mechanism
so it's sort of appropriate for learning under the conditions of uncertainty that you experience. So basically, saying you put it in a completely foreign environment. So um, how about the language? At least they have to understand the language. They don't necessarily have to understand the language. There's a field of cognitive robotics where robots have been shown through interactions to develop their own vernaculars, their own ontologies, their own languages is completely separate from the environment they're observing. So it literally becomes how do the systems or the agents interact with the environment to understand uh, a complete so field of system. The communication mechanism maybe can or will be completely unknown, right? Correct. But other than the, but there has to be some re re uh, representational formalism that has to be in place. It, it's what if it, that doesn't match the environment? Uh, well, that, that's the that's the scenario that I work from. Is you put a robot on a spacecraft and send it into a thousand years into space, mm -hmm. and it shows up in an environment that doesn't necessarily match the environment that it could have learned from mm -hmm. on Earth. So there's a an emerging theory in computer science that we need to learn more from experiences than from trained models things change so fast in ways that we can't necessarily predict and we don't have an opportunity to learn a model from it. So how do you tr teach a machine to observe, hypothesize, prove or disprove a model? So almost starting from basic principles. Yes. Okay. We first or second principles. So my uh, research interest is in social, uh, social mobility economic mobility and um, trying to understand what's happening here in Charlotte and I'm trying to collect all the data that are related to the economic mobility issues and I'm trying to ultimately I want to build up a model that can capture all the aspects of the mobility issue um, then I can use this model to change the community, to change the city. But at this moment, I'm just trying to maybe um, find a model just for one aspect, maybe just for a family or for the community or um, just for the little aspect of the topic and um, build up a model on this, then Later, I can add on more to the model. Yeah. Your family and its family is like a research work because Charlotte is interested in the concept of economic mobility because mm -hmm. we are number 50 out of 50 largest cities. So it turns out the likelihood that somebody will move from the lowest bracket to the highest bracket in terms mm -hmm. of impact would demand the money issues. So it would be an issue. Mm -hmm. Clara? So my research is quite interdisciplinary. Um, Unlike either ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, in the healthcare setting. It's uh, almost like putting a new face to measuring stigma. And uh, stigma is any label that um, anyone in the community could put on anyone else who look different, or speak different, or just behave differently. And, um, but it has negative connotation, because that can put a label of somebody the person in higher regard, then it wouldn't be stigma, right? Exactly. That's a negative label. Uh, it's almost attached. It's um, it's um, basically towards mental illness or behavioral health. Um, we it's quite common. Uh, almost forty-three million individuals are um, impacted with behavioral disorders every year. Forty-three million. Yeah. In in the world or the United States. In the United States. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, it costs two hundred and one billion dollars. According to a study in uh, 2016, uh, it's the most expensive medical disorder claimed in the United States. And the number of suicides is on the rise, and what we are trying to do is uh, uh, come back to the way uh, the measurement of stigma should happen. Uh, so far, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of traditional methods being implemented, but there is definitely a lack of uh, standard way to be able to compute stigma and talk about it with numbers. Um, obviously, in this century, numbers are very powerful because they're driving the decision-making processes and policy-making decisions. 
So this is what we're trying to do, bring a number to stigma and be able to uh, see it moving up and down over time so that we can better challenge stigma and hopefully um, help implement the better decision making um, processes to, to um, reduce stigma and even shift the focus of the funding that goes on mental disorders and different ways that we could better improve uh, the lives of those individuals impacted by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do they see in some specific groups stigma is higher? Do they have this type of research? Uh, there is obviously a lot of work uh, that's done in terms of maybe racial mm -hmm. affiliation mm -hmm. or even gender. Mm -hmm. um, Motivation-wise, like you know, yeah. veterans or. In fact, in the last uh, analysis I conducted, it was done through the mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the nation. It's the biggest nation uh, program. Uh, to help uh, educate individuals about mental disorders. And I found out in my analysis so far that um, in uh, working settings, people view stigma differently yeah. than when it comes to family relations or marriage relationships. And this is one of the things that actually the um, National Council in the meeting found to be quite interesting and a common um, finding they are also looking into uh, realizing. So, yeah. Thank you. Nick, anything you want to what you already said? Um, well, I, I, I do deal with data science in terms of the visual complexity of the icons and so forth, but I don't know, I just feel kind of moved by this discussion of data science for social good and the social good that can happen um, in terms of like, defining problems as complex adaptive systems and, and figuring out through simulation you know, how it affects people. So I, I, I have worked for the Institute for Social Capital, as you know, on campus, and um, they have so a lot of a good. Database administrator. Yes, <laughs> basically, um, but you know, they're and and data wrangling the different data. What are you laughing at? <laughs> 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 but um, you know, and, and and making that available to to different researchers on campus and off campus. So, um, but yeah, there's there's some data over there that and can that social, can help people. Social capital related. To social data capital. Data. capital. Yeah. That's, but uh, my own research, um, it, it does seem a little uh, different, for, I guess, than, than most of the other fields. It's never too late. Yeah, <laughs> to come on over to the other side. <laughs> to the other side. Well, I, I, I will say that, that what I'm working on right now does have to do with um, figuring out the features, the visual features of the icon that, that can influence. Which is human-related. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's not um, psychological, maybe not social, but um, yeah. I mean, and if you want a real life application for yeah. how it can help let's, let's pub public public um, signs, transportation signs, things like that, we don't realize, but icons aren't just these little, uh, you know, pictorials that are on our computers. They're also in um, other areas of everyday life. So. Oh, for signs, that, that's actually true. But you know, countries like Bosnia have no problems now with that. We have no signs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So let's talk about something else. Now everybody, and it doesn't matter, whoever. Uh, tell me one thing. What do you think is, in your mind, in your estimation, is wrong with this world that you would like to get if we could? In any order, it doesn't matter. Or you basically say that's not my concern to begin with. So. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going first. Um, All right, the brave guy. You get two points. Um, for what class? <laughs> um, I, I think the wasting here in the United States is a big issue. No, it doesn't have to be United yeah. States. Anything. Yeah, whole but, world, but if you want to make it the United that's, States, that's, that's fine. That's really right. Because I travel to Europe. I see the difference between here, between Europe, and even between my my country between China, the difference in these three places. Mm -hmm. People here use a lot of paper towers, paper tissues. Oh, waste, you said. Yeah, yeah waste. waste. Yeah, and we waste more here than other. People. Than other, yeah, yeah, a lot. And also the <laughs> the um, use the use of plastic bags in the supermarket, mm -hmm. and all these types of wasting. Actually, you can 
we can avoid it here. And it's a big amount of um, what do you say? Maybe tree and big amount of it's energy. ecological consequences. Yeah. yeah. So what are they doing in Europe in China? They bring their own bear? Uh, in Europe, I had to bought three uh, three shopping bags in yeah, three make you market for because I always forgot it because I'm so used to what we have here. We always have plastic bags in supermarket, yeah. so I bought one. I forgot it <laughs> in the hotel, and then I bought the second one, and finally I had three from the two weeks <laughs> trip. He brought it to the to the US. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you using them here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you using them here or you turn back I to the use, I use one of them to carry my lunch. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> yeah, I try to avoid using the plastic bag as much as possible. And it's a little bit different in China because we are still using the bags, but the plastic bags, but they charge for it. Then so you think about it. Uh, yeah, you have to pay. But that was about ten years. They, we have to pay like ten or twenty cents for that. By the by the time you, it was the policy came out, I think people thought about it. They use their own bags to save money. But now the bags are still only ten or twenty cents after ten years. So I don't see any difference between China and here, but in Europe they are doing very good. Anybody else? Well, I will say that in defense, at least of America, <laughs> in general, oh, okay. the Patriot. There are lots yeah. of uh, different places. I don't know. Um, you mentioned one in Berkeley before. And I know that that in the southeast there that that is the case. I think where everyone. And waste oh, more. Okay. I'm not saying they don't waste more elsewhere as well, but um, you know there are are many other places where you use your own bags and um, where they also charge you for plastic. You know, so it just depends on where you are. Okay. But in Harris Theater for my wife and I, we buy that. They make you buy if you want to that other one that's more durable. Yeah. And so you bring it next time. Yeah. And we have ten at home. We never yeah, bring it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> The change has to come from within. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Actually, it, it depends on the environment, though. So what I would change, I would change people. Uh, like it's so hard to change people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would like to maybe at least people in the like we do in agent based modeling some influential or some ideas mm -hmm. established for social good they could be more people in that environment to make them believe in mm -hmm. because they always tell the ne negative things to you, whatever you do, like for mm -hmm. environmental thing, for social thing. So if they can see maybe more people who can believe it, mm -hmm. yeah, then maybe something can change. And like, if of course you have your bags from Trader Joe's, I don't want to market all the markets here. Yes. They have the bags, mm -hmm. we are using it, and then if you are an outlier, they are looking at you like, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. But if we can, have, not just for bags though, for anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing, Rihanna. Yeah, we, a couple of weeks ago yes. around how uh, in China we buy the plastic bags and as people shift and become more economically or upwardly mobile, mm -hmm. um, it's not Our such attention. a big deal yeah. anymore to spend a nickel for a bag. So mm -hmm. your, 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 your ethics change to, to a, a reflection of convenience of things. Mm -hmm. So now we end up taxing poor people. Well, we end, up, we end up doing a lot of things, and part of it is exactly what we were just talking about, coupled with stigma of mm. if you reuse things or you don't drive a particular class of car that's maybe outside of your economic reach, um, you're viewed as not necessarily being in the right socioeconomic strata. And that's probably one of the biggest problems we've got right now. My opinion is people overreach for the wrong reasons. You spend money to belong to a community or to appear to not belong to a community at the expense of uh, being able to invest that money in education or being able to invest that money in better uh, 
taking better health care of yourself or other types of things. So it's a it's a trade off that I think we do more for either social influence or social inconvenience than it is for the actual betterment of ourselves. Commercialism, I think, is the, the, the core of the problem. And I would say not necessarily capitalism. It's not. I feel like these are large, large ideas. I don't it know. Is. <laughs> Capitalism, I don't believe, is the problem because you go back a couple of generations in the U.S. and the kind of car that you drove was more focused on utility than it was on appearance. And now you see somebody driving a gigantic SUV more for more for appearance than for functionality, and that's that's an, an, uh, an unfortunate uh, thing. That driven uh, the cost of SUVs. I remember the first SUV I bought for work was like $18,000 and I kept it forever and then I bought another one and I kept it for 13 years and I was going to buy a new one and it had gone in a period of 13 years from $22,000 to $74,000. I like to I saw the one two weeks ago was $74,000. Yeah, really. It, 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 it really caused me to pause at that moment of how can something almost quadruple in cost in a period of 13 years when you know the cost of manufacturing right, right, right. did not. Yeah. And it's all driven largely by social demand and the stigma of not having a certain house in a certain neighborhood or a car in a certain time. I just want to add to it. I think the biggest challenge is uh, the there isn't a universal way of speaking to each other across the world. People look at things differently in different places. It depends on what your culture is, uh, what your nation is, where you were born, what your experience was, uh, what is it that how do you define, how do you see, how, what's your lens that you see the world from, and it's quite difficult to find solutions problems if they are defined differently across different Well, there's, and there's not just one well. solution yeah. to different problems. Exactly. Right? So, but realizing that diversity and then taking advantage of it in a way where we can all realize we all have our own unique lenses, mm -hmm. but we're seeing this, we are in the same world and we are sharing the same experiences. Mm -hmm. So we have to come together in any logical mm -hmm. way in order to, to, to reach those things. Yeah, it's not, I don't know, I used to think, oh, it's standardized, let's standardize everything. Um, I mean, that comes back to other things. So. Just want to add to that. Um, I think uh, if you look at the structure in society that we have in place, specifically in the United States, I think people are driven by incentives, you know, whether it be buying a SUV to impress your friends or, you know, or um, taking a bag at a grocery store that, you know, makes you pay for it. So there's different incentives in are built in, um, in the community and in, in the society and in the country as well. I think we have to look at those, you know, and see what how beneficial are those or how destructive there are those for uh, for a sustainability pro, um, viewpoint. For everyone, it's for, society. for everyone, yeah. We're talking about you know we want to you know capitalism is great, but if it's causing a huge divide between the rich and the poor, you know, is it that great or can we do something to fine tune it to? A better playing field for everyone. So this is something that I think needs to be uh, looked at and assessed. Okay, so um, we're running out of time. There's another group coming up. But so one quick question, actually. We, we heard everybody's dissertation idea so far. If you didn't work on your own, which of the ones that you heard would be one that you would send off to work? Only of the ones you heard. What will be your second favorite? <laughs> of this wow. limited uh, right. set of choices. Oh, economic mobility, of course. Echo, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody else? I so, mean, it's also very, very important since we're going through lots of different election cycles and so forth. You're running for an office. Things are not <laughs> yet. Not, not yet. yet. So, it's but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I don't know. But, I mean, we do all want. I mean, as I think, uh, 
graduate students uh, at an institute of higher learning, we want the betterment of a society. We want to help and teach and right. learn, you know. So, a part, like I like what you said about education as a catalyst to have a change because it really is required. Education, educating those around you, it's um, it's I think our duty as academics, um, and so I think that it's very valuable. Anyway, so, you know, we have these little models, and we, we create them on our computers, and we learn them, and it gives us numbers, but really the applications are far-reaching. Um, it's not just little numbers. On the I think this was your complete speech. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried. Okay, well. So I like Farrah's uh, perspective for, for a lot of different reasons, and one, probably the primary reason is when we understand how stigma is applied start to generalize that to other areas, uh, like you said, how economic, upwardly economically mobile are you, or do you pursue education or not, or who interacts with who in all of these various uh, conflict situations, and eventually maybe we could get to a way of coming up with your universal way of communicating in a more empathetic way. Standing as opposed to seeking the confirmation bias of the way I view things is the right way to view things, and everybody else, I really don't care so much about. Anybody else? You don't have to take us. Yeah, I agree with Rob because I, uh, I, I you always agree with Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's so, on, I'm paying him. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I worked in this project about disease burden and uh, uh, the relation between disease, disease, disease burden and uh, the uh, internet data, the Google Trends, the Twitter data, and I find a lot of uh, issue in, the, in some of the diseases that people uh, don't report the disease to the doctor at all, they don't, they don't say anything about what happened. They just go for internet sources, mm -hmm. and all of this will affect the, the, the measurement of the disease burden, and then you will affect the allocation of medical resources. So I think um, a unique measurement for this kind of, for the stigma will, you know, will be helpful to the whole healthcare area and I think it will be very interesting. At least to me it's very interesting. Yeah, as a yeah. <laughs> no pressure but <laughs> all yeah. yeah. uh, the <laughs> fix it for us. Yeah, right. Please. Anybody else? I try. Okay. I, I actually choose Vivian's work. Um, it's social behavioral change, it's modeling the social um, behavior. And this is something I have interested I have interest in and I think it could be uh, very impactful as well. Um, going from uh, society and protesting and why do people protest and what could lead to the world becoming a better place and how we can help to make that happen. What I see here, like almost always for us, like it's all connected to each other, all of our research. Yeah. So that's why maybe our name could turn into this social good things as well because everybody in our own aspects fit together. Except for the visualization. <laughs> <laughs> I like visualization. I maybe we can think about it. Make it media. Yes. <laughs> well, I can always, you know, help you can visualize your game. Yeah. 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 By the way, visualization is such an important tool to share with people. Yes, absolutely. Because they don't want to hear about the model. It's visual that communication. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's and the, I, uh, I really agree with that. And Ralph, yours is really evolutionary too. So in the long run, you know, it sounds so complex and methodologic. But I see the evolution in your uh, model, uh, hopefully, and very excited to kind see of, that. Kind of to, to Nick's point around visualization, your point as well, there's one working definition of big data that it's a data set that is so large that you cannot obviously infer anything from it just through the cursory analysis. And a lot of the things we do with large data sets when we start out are trying to come up with some intuitive perspectives from the data. And you can't do that without a meaningful visualization. Mm -hmm. And one, 
once you learn from that, you can't tell the story with the data without it. To another person. To another person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because we're visual creatures, and that's how. And then you have the last word. Ah, uh, so many good projects that are being done. I you hard. choose yours. <laughs> I, I choose. Uh, yeah, I can. I really, I really like all of them. It's hard to make a decision. Everybody knows so so many good, good things, sign. and uh, a lot of good projects. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learn more and see how we can all collaborate more with one another too. Thank you all. Thank you it's so much. wonderful to uh, spend time with you to learn, to learn more about you. So hopefully we're going to do it again. Yeah. Thank you. Looking forward to it.